Thank, thanks for the welcome. Um, so my big question is all about my reading of the book of Acts, the first 12 chapter of the book of Acts, about how that when the Holy Spirit came, it wasn't a, a personal experience of the Holy Spirit, but it really actually transformed all the structures of society. It's all about breaking down barriers, and that's what I want to explore today. So I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. So um, I've been ordained quite a long time now. Uh, I've been in Islington and in Southall. And the last 11 years, I was a vicar in Leeds in quite an inner city parish, um, very diverse. And we had a lot of um, refugees, particularly from Iran, who became Christians. It was a very exciting ministry. And it was very much about God uh, creating a community that was really diverse. And, and, and for me, that's a vision of heaven meeting earth and how the early church was is a real vision of heaven meeting earth because it was so wonderful in the first 12 chapters of Acts. So we're going to look a bit at that. I obviously can't go through the whole thing, but just a little bit of a, an overview. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about myself first, going right back. So I was born in Yorkshire. You can't tell from my accent. I can't talk Yorkshire. Is anyone from Yorkshire here? No, 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 surely, no. Are there no Leeds fans? No. Oh, that's terrible. I'm going to go now, Nicola. Uh, there's no Leeds fans. Uh, has anyone been north of Watford ever? <laughs> so I was born in Yorkshire, but I haven't got the accent. And um, I was born to Hindu parents. My parents were very lovely, but they were Hindu. And I was brought up quite no faith really. I mean, they, they were Hindu, but they didn't really practice when I was young. And I didn't really understand Hinduism. It was extremely complicated. And, uh, but I went to a church school, so I, I started to get a little bit of a grasp of who Jesus was. But I didn't have a living faith. I just believed in God, and that was it. And um, when I was 10, my parents took me to India. I, I hadn't been, I'd been once when I was very young. And they took me to India. Um, it's a long time ago, but it was after the Bangladesh war, and it was extremely, extremely um, difficult. There was a huge amount of poverty. Everywhere you looked, there were people lying on the streets, people with hardly any clothes. Everywhere you went out the door, there were beggars, and we lived in quite a bit of luxury. And, it, and even at 10, that was a, a profoundly disturbing experience. And it was only when I understood Jesus, when I was a student, uh, that... I really grasped that Jesus was there to bring transformation because in India, people thought this is your life station, this is your karma, this is what, um, that's not a curry by the way, that's your life station, uh, that's where you're born into and it's very hard to bring change. So poverty in India is really hard to get beyond um, the situation that, you, you, that you're born into. And I found this really difficult, even as a child. And then... Um, the other thing they've got in India, which I found really difficult, was the caste system, of course, because that's the station that you're born into. So I, I gradually, as a teenager, I thought Hinduism isn't for me, and I sort of started looking into Christianity. But when I was at university, I met some Christians, and they had such a joy and such a peace that I thought, gosh, they've got something, I want something of that. And when I first became a Christian, I saw when I started to read the Bible uh, how Jesus was there with, with people who were marginalized, people nobody else loved, people who were thought to be untouchable. And Jesus had this impact on me that he was there for the poor, the suffering. And, and when I was called to ministry, that was very much at the heart of my call. Um, after university, I went to work for a church in, in the Midlands, in West Bromwich, and another football team. And... Um, I worked there and like a youth worker, parish assistant, and that's when I really started feeling called to ministry. And it, that was a very um, urban area, very multicultural, very deprived area. And I started to get a sense that God was calling me to that kind of ministry. So, uh, and then after that, I was, um, shortly after that, I was touched by the Holy Spirit, like renewed by the Holy Spirit. I had a really profound experience of the Holy Spirit after I became a Christian. And um, so those things are really important to me, the charismatic side and the love of justice and serving the poor. And, and up to now, I'm now, I'm now living in the city. I'm living in the most affluent part of London. Um, so, but I, I've got a role of director of ministry in the two cities and lead DDO. But 
up to now, the, I've come with my wife, Alison, we've, we've been in uh, very urban areas, and, and much of what we do now, we still, um, you know, I was, in terms of vocations, we're trying to get diverse vocations from different people, different backgrounds, and so on. But it's slightly different, but up to now, we have had this very urban ministry. So, um, I used to wonder when I first became a Christian, why so few evangelicals and charismatics, when I, this is, this is a long time ago, were not um, working in, in these different People had a bit of a heart to be a missionary, to go abroad. That was quite an exciting thing. But nobody really wanted to go to the inner city. And I, I just wondered why that was. And, and when I first became a Christian, there wasn't a lot of talk about justice and serving the poor. Some of the things that you've um, prayed about today, there wasn't much. Evangelicals were actually very suspicious about doing any social action. They thought that would taint them and make them liberal. Although that has all changed. But I always thought that Jesus modeled being someone who was always there for the marginalized, the unloved, the poor, the, 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 the desperate. He was always there. And uh, just starting from Luke chapter 4, you know, his great commission, I've come to bring good news to the poor, and so on, which I'm sure you know. So, um, John, let's see if we get the slide. So I did, um, I did write a book, okay, so I've written a book, so, uh, which you can buy, it's, it's from all major uh, uh, shops you can get that but it's also I've, I've brought a few copies but my, my book is actually a study of the first 12 chapters of Acts and it is about how the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts and brought transformation and brought change in, in a really radical way so I call my book Holy Spirit Radicals but it was such a radical change in the way that uh, society was uh, in the early, uh, just in the years after Jesus' death. So Pentecost, the next, yeah. so Pentecost, if you start with Pentecost in Acts 2, Pentecost, I see that as an inversion of Babel. You know in Babel where everybody was spread and nobody could understand each other. There was no communication. Everyone was doing what they wanted to do. They were saying, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. They wanted to operate in their own power and achievement and seeking their own power. But the power only belonged to God. And then God dispersed them, scattered them abroad. And they couldn't understand each other. There was no comprehension. And, and you could see it was very destructive because people couldn't communicate anymore. But then Pentecost erupted. Pentecost came and Pentecost is absolutely the opposite because at Pentecost, people were filled with the Spirit and everyone could understand each other who was gathered there. There were people gathered there on this Jewish festival of Shavuot and they could understand each, each other's uh, mother tongues. And the Holy Spirit broke down all barriers of language, race, nationality, pointing people to Jesus alone. And I think that runs all the way through the book of Acts, that the way that uh, the Holy Spirit came and broke down all the barriers of race and ethnicity, class, you know, slaves became Christians. It was an amazing transformation that happened. And I think we've lost sight of that a bit now. And uh, I suppose that's what I'm really passionate about. And I'm pleased that Nicola has invited me to share a bit. Uh, I a couple of years ago, I did speak at New Wine on this. Um, then uh, something else happened in Azusa Street. You might have heard um, in 1906, when that was the beginning of the charismatic movement. And in Azusa Street um, in uh, Los Angeles, uh, there was a huge movement of the spirit. But what was really significant was that because America was quite segregated then, it was completely broke down all racial barriers, all social class barriers. And that's the beginning of the charismatic movement. There was one woman who started praying for another person, and suddenly she was praying in fluent Chinese, even though she didn't know a word of Chinese. There was a huge miracle going on. I mean, I, I did a language degree first, and it took me like 11 years to understand what a, a plu perfect was. But the, here where she was in three seconds, she could... Um, pray in fluent Chinese, an absolute miracle. But the main thing 
was that all barriers were broken down. They called it the color line was washed away. Uh, it was absolutely a huge miracle. And I think that's the beginning of the roots of the charismatic movement. That's why it's so powerful. So in the early church, they shared everything. We've got the next one. Um, in Acts 2, what happened then when the Holy Spirit came? They were radically changed. They didn't become a club or an inward-looking sect. They were really outward-looking. And that's something we really need to watch out for today. And, and there's something that we always seem that we like to be where we're comfortable, living in, in our little comfortable spaces, uh, a bit inward looking, maintaining what we have. But the whole, in the book of Acts, they were so zealous to share the love of God. And they, they, they didn't have any preconceptions. They just went where the Holy Spirit went, uh, sent them. And they were so outward looking. Um, I don't know what's happened to the slide. Okay, yeah, so there's, there's a book I read um, a couple of years ago by Rodney Stark, The Rise of Christianity, and this book was really interesting. The early church reached all social classes and women and men from rich to slaves, and it was completely cross-cultural because in those days society was very much delineated by uh, your life station, what you were born into, what is your... Um, what, almost like India, you know, what class you were born into, rich and the poor didn't mix. It was very, um, very much delineated. But in the early church, all kinds of people became Christians from all different cultures, all backgrounds, slaves and the very wealthy. And, and this was a hugely powerful thing. And, and the other thing that was really powerful in the early church was that they were, the Christians went out to serve those in need. So they went out into the plagues and they went out to serve people where nobody else would go. And, and that made a huge impact because they went out and they were really, really um, full of the spirit to go and serve and to show the love of Jesus in action. So um, we can ask ourselves as well, how do we listen to our own communities? You know, we, we were just walking down, you've got the fun fair there. If you walk around your community, who, who's not at church? Who's here? Who isn't there? Um, there's so many people who are, who are missing from church. Serve our community. Sorry. How can we serve our community? And how do we help people uh, from all different backgrounds grow into confidence and leadership? So I'm, I'm working on that at the moment. So, um, you know, Ben Lindsay wrote this book about um, race, which is really quite profound. And he was saying, you know, often people of color are just asked to make the tea and their, their gifts are not um, seen fully. And I think sometimes that does happen. I remember when I was a curate, I was a curate in Islington and um, this woman, she, she, she was in the school playground, I was chatting and I invited her to an alpha course. She came, she was really nervous. But then in the third week of alpha, she became a Christian, which was amazing. She was really touched by God and it was really powerful. And then uh, about 10 years later, she rang me out of the blue and said, oh, uh, hi, I, I'm a church warden. I thought, this is amazing. You know, she's just come and now um, people have helped her, mentored her, and she's grown really strong in her faith. So we can give people time, we can help people break down barriers, and we can really create um, a church where barriers are broken down. So we, we come now to the, to the bit that we read in Acts chapter 6. And this is a really interesting passage. The apostles listened um, when they were faced with a logistical dilemma. Uh, so from the beginning of the church, the church was, as I mentioned, very, very multicultural and across all social backgrounds. There were two major groups, the Hebraic Jews, which included the apostles, the church leaders, and the Hellenistic Jews, they were the Greek Jews. So then they, they had a problem. Uh, the Hellenistic Jews were complaining that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food, so they were hungry. And so they've come in from, into Jerusalem, they've come from a different place, they were probably looked down upon and seen with a bit of suspicion. And we often look at um, incomers with suspicion, there's a human nature thing. And then we can see from this suspicion and disdain 
that um, the, the distinction between the two groups was really, really visible. Now, John Stott, he wrote in a commentary that, um, that we must go beyond origin and language to culture. There had always been rivalry between these groups in Jewish culture. The tragedy is that it was perpetuated within the new community of Jesus, who by his death had abolished such distinctions. So then we had these widows, and in those days the widows had no uh, rights, no pension. They depended on support uh, from their families. And if they had no family, uh, they just relied on, on benefactors, whoever would give them food. So it looked to these Jews that the, the um, Hebraic Jews were being favored. So what did the apostles do when they heard this problem? So first of all, uh, they listened. They listened to the problem. And then they prayed and they focused on their mission and calling. And they came up with a solution, which was quite a novel one for antiquity, because those with political power generally repressed people who were minorities. So then um, what they did was they um, came and prayed together and they exhorted um, seven people to be deacons. So they had this role to administer food and to make sure that everyone had been looked after and cared for, and, and the apostles could uh, get on with, with the role of preaching. So it's about using gifts as well. But it's about breaking down distinctions and barriers because those people who had less were now being looked after. So how do we live this out? I think there are a few things that we can do uh, that I found in my ministry that can be helpful. Um, first one is uh, getting out into your community. I think that's, a, a, for me, that's one of the great things about being an Anglican is that you, that you serve a whole parish. You don't just serve um, just the church community. It's not, not just the church, it's the whole community. So walking around, it's just interesting to prayer walk around your community, listen to God, who's missing. Uh, God might give you a prompt. There might be someone hurting. Um, I remember um, praying around uh, my parish when I was in Southall and, and, and we were praying around these blocks of flats and uh, interestingly every time you prayed somewhere someone would come to church from that building. So prayer is really, really powerful and, and it's about praying about things that you might not normally uh, realize. So prayer walking is really uh, powerful, Listen, listening to God and looking for signs to what to pray for. I think it's really good to pray for a few streets um, each week. So in, in one of our parishes, we used to uh, list a couple of streets every week that we'd pray for. And then sometimes we'd walk down those streets and prayer walk on those streets. Uh, and that's, that's heaven breaking into earth where people might not go to church. They might start um, getting a bit of a sense of God at work. So who knows what's going on? It's also praying for needs as well. What are the needs in your community that you might not have known or addressed? There might be ways of, of helping people or supporting people or, or like a food bank or, or different ways of supporting that you might not be aware of. So I think that's really powerful. Uh, so getting out, prayer walking, and, and a bit of risky listening. Because God might ask you to do something you hadn't thought of and praying about that. And churches have got a real significance um, in their communities because um, Anne Morrissey, she, she was, used to work in this diocese and she, she's written a book called Beyond the Good Samaritan. And she said that churches have been present in their communities for decades, if not for centuries. No other agency will have the voice and depth of history that the church represents. And the local church must harness and be allowed to harness this asset wisely and generously because it cannot easily be replicated. So being a church, we become very visible in our community, and it can be somewhere where we can connect to the wider community and get involved in what's going on. And in our ministry, we've been involved in different ways in the community. I'm not really sure what you do here. I'm sure you do loads of things, but I think just being aware of these things and just thinking who's at church, who isn't at church, who can we pray for? How can we pray for greater... Uh, diversity in our churches because there's, there's always uh, people missing and why are they missing it's worth thinking about that and praying about that so I'm nearly there now I don't know how long I've been Nicola <laughs> uh, 
Um, so this was our church in Leeds, which is a really diverse community. I think the picture on the right is what it looked like when the pews were there. And, and one of the things that really struck us was that there were a number of people used to come in wheelchairs, and, and they had to sort of be st stuck in a little corner, and they couldn't really worship freely. So we listened to them, and they said, well, we want to be integrated. So when we took the pews out, we, we could put wheelchairs wherever, and we created this wonderful vision of a community, all different um, people from different backgrounds. There were people from um, quite working-class backgrounds, people with disabilities, uh, middle-class people. Uh, we had a number of asylum seekers. And so what I'm trying to say is that we really were praying for a vision of heaven, a diverse community of God's people you know, reflecting who lived in our parish. And uh, God uh, had worked really powerfully and brought all these different people together and we worshipped together. So I think that's powerful. And, and then the other one was that we uh, worked with uh, a lot with asylum seekers and refugees. And one person... Uh, had seen a number of people arriving isolated in the parish and wanted to know what they could do like 15 years ago and they prayed and they started off by inviting people to church having English lessons and then the providing food and, and that really grew so now maybe 200 uh, people a week would come through the doors and a number of those just experienced the love of Jesus in such a powerful way that they became Christians. So God can work in amazing ways when we listen to our communities. So I think, um, I think that's all I've got to share, really, uh, just to reflect on the book of Acts and how the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit came. It didn't just touch us on a personal level, but it really transformed how society operated. And if we go back to that, we can see amazing things happening. And uh, so, some of the great revivals that have happened in the world have often been where barriers have been broken down and people haven't thought about background or where people come from, but instead look to the uh, might and power of God and what God is able to do. So uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this community here and we pray that you will give us a fresh vision of all that you are able to do. Give us listening ears and receptive hearts and, and fill us with your spirit to go out and serve your community with a passion and a vigor and that we will see lives transformed and people coming to a living faith. Amen. <laughs>